Greetings, friends. My name is Pastor Myron. I'd like to welcome you to the Saturday night service of Grace Wesley in Fort Lauderdale, where we're a welcoming community of believers sharing Christ's grace, love, and redemption with all. It's good to see the faithful, faithful in God's house tonight, especially in light of the, the storms and the rivers that are out there taking the place of our streets. And uh, some of us in the neighborhoods, man, you've got to go through a six-inch deep little thing to get out of your driveway. But once you get on the main roads, it wasn't so bad. But it's good to have everybody here today. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, this week, we'll have the men's group on Monday. Tuesday night is prayer night. It's not the chosen this Tuesday night. It's a prayer night. And the prayer night takes place down in the sanctuary. And Tony Ash will be leading that this month. And Annette and I will be leaving tomorrow after service to go to Little Rock to celebrate Mom's 90th birthday. And don't applaud. <laughs> I'll let Mom know you all applauded. But I just, I just want to say, does something magical happen when you turn 90? To work, to work, no, I'm asking because, you know, it's like if you miss a doctor's appointment, you get to call and say, oh, you know, I just turned 90 and I just forgot. So is it some kind of automatic excuse that you get now because you turned 90 and you can miss things and it's like, okay, I don't know. But she, she's working it, man. She is working it. She's already done it two, a couple times on different stuff. And she's, well, you know, I'm 90 now. And so you have to give me a little more slack. It's like, okay, in one week, suddenly you get more slack. It's all good. But uh, anyway, I, we appreciate all the prayers and the well wishes uh, for us traveling. And uh, we're going to go up and see mom and see some family and uh, just take a little time off and relax ourselves uh, up in the mountains of Arkansas. Hopefully we'll make it back down. But uh, we'll see you all back in a couple weeks. Franklin will be leading the services while we're gone. And I'll still be available in emergencies. If you need me, you know how to reach out and, and get me. But um, I uh, just want to say today as well, we had the funeral service for George Paparelli uh, down in the sanctuary. And, and there were a lot of people from uh, First Church and from Larry's Church and then from our church here, and people that knew George from around the community. And it was really good to see the outpouring uh, for someone like that that served in so many ways in the community. Everybody showed up, and they had all served with George somewhere. You know, he was one of those quiet Christian men that, yeah, you saw him in church every week, but you didn't realize that he was serving in so many things. And he was doing and serving, and he was just a quiet faithful presence in so many ways and it was a blessing to have him be a part of our church in the last year he his health wasn't the best so he didn't get to get a chance to engage with a lot of folks but we had a good representation today and the service went well and his wife patricia who attends our sunday morning services is appreciative of all the prayers and the well wishes and the, the phone calls and everything the last couple of weeks for those of you that reached out to them and as your pastor i appreciate again once again the heart of our church that reaches out and cares uh, for the members of our church. Thank you all for that. With that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to come to your house today to worship you. And, and Lord, your Spirit's here waiting on us when we get here. So now we ask that your, your Spirit come alive in each of us. Lord, enliven us, uh, uh, enliven our hearts, awake our, awaken our minds so that we can hear the messages you have for us today, Lord. And as Freddie leads us in song, Lord, hear our hearts and our love for you as we sing praises to you. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Friends, as you're able, please stand and join us as we state our beliefs as found in the historic Apostles' Creed. The words will be on your screen and they're in your bulletin. Let us state our beliefs. I believe in God the Father, mighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary he suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening, everybody. So for our first reading... We're going to hear from the 28th chapter of Genesis, 
verses 10 to 19. So Genesis, the first book of the Bible, was written and compiled by Moses, most likely between the 15th and 13th centuries BC. And Genesis comes from a Hebrew word pronounced brashid, which means in the beginning. Its storyline actually divides into two main parts. The first 11 chapters tell the story about God and the whole world, and the remaining tell the story about God, Abraham, and then Abraham's family. Now the story of Jacob is a prime example of God's grace. Jacob was a cheater who cheated his own brother Esau out of his inheritance and blessing when he deceived his old and blind father, Isaac. In fact, the name Jacob means supplanter, which is somebody who wrongfully takes the place of another, a deceiver, and Jacob lived up to the meaning of his name. Jacob was willing to lie, cheat, and steal. So why would God choose someone like Jacob to carry out his plan of building a holy nation? Despite Jacob's flaws, God passionately pursued him. Clearly, God's choices do not always depend on a person's behavior. He simply chooses the people he wants. God can use a person in spite of their human weakness to become a powerful force for good in God's overall plan. Paul raised the very question of God's choices, but then concluded that we have no right to find fault with God's choices because we know so little especially when compared to God's infinite understanding. Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau for having cheated Esau out of his family birthright. Yet God comes to Jacob with bright promises, not a scolding, while Jacob is crossing the desert alone. God confirmed that every blessing he had promised Abraham would apply to Jacob. God would be with and watch over Jacob wherever Jacob went. Here's a reminder of God's grace when we look at his choice of Jacob and God's faithfulness in fulfilling the promises that he made to Abraham. In Christian terms, God, I'm sorry, grace can be described as God's favor toward the unworthy. And the story about Jacob gives hope to all imperfect people. And now the reading, beginning at verse 10. Jacob's dream at Bethel. Jacob left Beersheba and sent out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised you. And when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel. And that ends the first reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Let's all stand and bless the name of the Lord with this song. Let's worship together. Listen. 
be your name every blessing every blessing You may be seated. Okay, so for our second reading, we'll be hearing from the eighth chapter of Romans, verses 12 to 25. Now, the Apostle Paul, who was the author of Romans, was an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin and a Pharisee schooled by rabbis. Romans is considered one of the most significant of Paul's writings and was likely written around 57 AD. Paul wrote his letter to the Romans while in Corinth to a vibrant church in the city of Rome while on his third missionary journey. Now surely we can all relate to Paul when he said that sometimes he doesn't do what he wants to do and sometimes the things he does he knows he shouldn't. Paul feels as though he doesn't understand himself and he's expressing part of what we experience as humans. That's our reality too. But Paul reminds us of the hope we have in Christ. Through Christ, we can be free from this cycle. As we accept God's grace and love and share it with others, we're slowly freed from the way we lived before our acceptance and sharing. Now, Paul doesn't ever minimize suffering because he too endured beatings, imprisonment, and shipwrecks. There were attempts to assassinate him, and he suffered from chronic illness. But Paul assures us that future rewards will far outweigh any present sufferings. A Christian's life on earth may involve many hardships and difficulties. However, the end result will be glorious and will make the hardships and difficulties seem worthwhile. Though Paul was a Pharisee and well-educated by rabbis, it was the Holy Spirit that had shaped Paul into a skillful communicator of the faith. The book of Romans is about the good news, the gospel, 
And the theme of this particular chapter is the Holy Spirit. Paul gives a survey of the difference the Spirit can make in a person's life. Paul tells us that the Spirit doesn't remove all problems, but it does help and comfort us. The Holy Spirit can intercede for us when we cry out to God in our prayers. And now the reading beginning at verse 12. Life through the Spirit. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the, the misdeed, misdeeds of the body, and you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we're children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And that ends the second reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's stand and sing this next song. It will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine.
forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Amen. Let us pray for our offering. Dear Father, we thank you for all the things that you do for us. Lord, for you care for us. You love us so much. You love us so much that even when we're still a mess, you sent Jesus, Jesus for us. You set us up for success while we were in the midst of our failure. And Lord, you've blessed us beyond words. And for that, we're so grateful. We offer back now a small part of what you first gave us because a small part is all you ask for, Lord. We ask that you accept these gifts. And Lord, I ask that you bless these gifts and bless, these, bless the givers. May your spirit guide their use so that they be used to build your kingdom here on earth. And may the meditations of all of our hearts, wherever we are, in the words of my mouth, be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join us as we sing our doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Good evening, friends. I got a quick question for you. You know, we've been on this program here trying to make the Grace Wesleyan uh, attendees the smartest Christians in town. That's been an ongoing quest here for a couple of years. So now, in the book of Matthew here, we, this, we've been going through these major discourses. Do y'all remember how many discourses there are in Matthew? There's five. The first one was the Sermon on the Mount. The second one was the Missional Discourse. And we're in the third one now, which is the parabolic discourse. See, my goal here is for y'all to kind of know that Matthew has five primary sections with some little ones plugged in between, and that you'll know what they are. And you'll know that there's things in Matthew that aren't in other places, and you'll know where to find them. See, that's kind of the goal here. Because like many of you, I sat in the church pews for years, and I'm learning some of these things. And I'm like, well, they never told us that before. You know, and it's, it's, it's small knowledge, but... From what I gather is most of us, the thing that, that keeps us from going out and sharing our faith sometimes is we're afraid we don't know the Bible good enough. We're afraid we don't know enough. We're afraid that the, the little knowledge we don't have. So I'm trying to give you some of those little knowledge nuggets. And that's the goal here so that over the course of time you'll grow in your confidence about you know where what stuff is in the Bible. And it'll make you feel better when you encounter those times where it's unavoidable and you've got to share something. So today we're in the parabolic discourse, which means it's the parables, okay? And so last week was a parable about the sower and the seeds. And you remember we had the seeds, they were all good seeds. And we had different types of soil, right? And then we had the miraculous results, the 30, 60, and 100 fold of produce. Well this week, just following that in Matthew, we have another story about seeds. But this story about seeds is good seeds and bad seeds. It's the same soil, but there's good seeds and bad seeds. And Jesus is being a little strong here. He's, he's giving us a warning and a clarification. That's what he gave the people then, and that's what we should find here now. And there's a warning and clarification. The warnings are multiple levels, but the clarification is, is true for all of time. Okay, so what we're going to hear today is something that on the surface we've all heard it before. And a couple of years ago I went up to Indiana to do a funeral for one of my cousins that passed. And I stopped in a wheat field. Fortunately, the cousin of mine that was driving me around, he knew the owner of that wheat field, so we weren't at risk of getting shot. 
But he, we got out and we whacked some out of the wheat field. So this is real wheat right here. Not the store bought that you get from Christian book that you buy the stuff for just for using in sermons. This is real wheat. And when you look at it, you can see there's little kernels on there. And, you know, each little stalk comes up. And then when it flowers, it has all these little kernels. And there's the, the produce right there. You remember we were talking about the, the uh, one seed, if they got a seven-fold return or a ten-fold return? That was like, yeah, we had a good year, bumper crop. And Jesus is talking 30, 60, and 100. But today he's talking about wheat in a different context. He's talking about wheat and something called tares. It's also, it's also it's called darnel. It's a kind of weed. It's called a mimic weed. And it's a mimic weed because it mimics the plant that it's growing up among. So in this case, the tares looks just like wheat when it first starts growing. And if you're not a skilled botanist or horticulturist or whatever the person is that deals with the wheat, then you might not know what this was growing up. You might look, oh, that's just wheat, but it's not. So let's read what happens when Jesus is telling this parable. Now, keep in mind that in the mix of all these, Jesus has been challenged by the Pharisees and they don't like him already, and they're plotting to kill him. And so part of this is going to speak to religious leaders, okay? And it's going to speak to people in the faith community of his day and us today. So here the reading. We're going to pick up in uh, 13, uh, uh, chapter... Need to look up here. Chapter 13, 24, 24, I'm sorry, sorry. I had the right place, but it didn't make sense. This is Jesus talking, it's all red letters. So here's what Jesus said. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go out and pull them out, pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came with him. Explain to us this parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God. You know, this is a pretty harsh message, folks. I mean, the original parable, as he told it to the crowd out there, everybody understood the sowing the good seed. And everybody understood that when you sow the good seed out in the field, invariably, invariably, some weeds come along and get in the mix. People understood that. And that's the thing about the darnel, uh, uh, the tares, is it grows up and it looks exactly like wheat until it flowers and when the wheat's flowering to bring forth the kernels the darnel reveals itself and by then what's happened is in the root structure it does what weeds do you know when you pull those weeds out of your flower bed and you're trying to be careful to get them out from around your flowers that you really want don't they often pull up the flower roots too because see that's what weeds do weeds get all in there and they they, they take over the primary uh, 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 vegetation and they grow all in together so you can't really separate it from them. And they rob the nutrients. That's one of the reasons why we want to pull it out so our flowers and stuff grow bigger and richer, more color, more vibrant. With the weeds in there, they kind of get choked out. 
And that's what happens with the wheat. And so when Jesus is saying, this means this, what he's talking, this is where the warning comes in. We should hear this loud and clear. Jesus sows the gospel message. And we hear the gospel message. And we respond to the gospel message. But the devil ain't standing for it. The devil's not going to let this goodness rise on its own. He's going to combat it. And so he enters in the mix. Some terrors, some darn owl, some mimic weeds. Looks like Christians, talk like Christians, act like Christians. But some of the stuff they say when it comes to bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Hold on a second. It's not there. Now, we might say, well, golly gee, that could be all of us. Because last time I checked, we're all Romans 7.15 Christians, right? We don't do what we want to do, and what we do was not what we want to do. Isn't that Romans, that's what they read last week. Isn't that all of us? At one time or another? See, we have to be careful here, because pulling out the weeds might pull good fruit up, good, pull good plants out. And in the church context that Jesus is planting... The devil's planting some stuff in our midst, but what he's planted in our midst is not just individual people. He's planted stuff in each of us. Bad habits, bad thoughts, errant behavior. Doesn't mean we don't love God. Doesn't mean we don't love Jesus. Just means from time to time we run into this human reality just like Paul did. Oops. So Jesus in the story the landowner says, no, don't, don't, don't pull them up. Wait until the end of times. Wait to harvest. And the angels will come then. Because when everything's flowered, at the end of things, then God will look at the hearts of the people. He'll look at the fruit that we bear. And he'll make the judgment then. We shouldn't be quick to make the judgment now because we should be fearful of the fact that we might get swept up in our own judgment. That would be kind of harsh, wouldn't it? But that's what we do. We're all guilty of that. You know, in, in, the, in the, the church sense, you know, we, we've got uh, uh, all kinds of different folks out there claiming to be Christians. They all claim, we all claim the same Jesus. But it's like hamburgers. We all say we like hamburgers. But some folks say, yeah, well, I like hamburgers. But yeah, but I don't want the bun because the bun, that's like the Old Testament law. There's all that stuff in there about sin and whatnot. And so I don't, like, I don't want the bun. Oh, you can leave the patty off because that patty is all about confession and repentance of sin and, and all that. And, and you know, I would, the, that sin's a bad thing to talk about. Let's leave sin out of it. Oh, and you can leave off the lettuce and tomato too. Because that lettuce and tomato is about the transformation that Jesus does in people. People are going to change. We don't want to tell people that they got to change because Jesus is going to change them. And we're not going to make them change, but Jesus is, and they need to get used to that idea. And so when we're all saying we like hamburgers, we all like Jesus, we're not describing the same thing in reality. Because what some folks have is pickles, onions, and a little shot of mustard. It doesn't really resemble a hamburger in actual practice. Okay? It might say Jesus on the building. They might say, yeah, we're Christian. But when you get in and you listen to the messages and you see what the people are doing, it's not really re resembling the Jesus that Scripture's talking about. It doesn't really resemble the gospel. They're not talking about we're all sinners. We're all doing what we don't want to do, and, 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 and we don't, what we want to do, we can't do. We're all Romans 7.15 people, but oh, whoa. While we can admit we're sinners and we all struggle, and we don't want to judge each other because we, all, we know we're all judge-worthy, right? We all have room to be judged. But yet we look around, and it's like in the midst of the crop that Jesus has planted, there's imposters. There's weeds. There's mimic weeds. Claiming to be Christian, but they're not. But see, we can recognize those because God's gifted us with discernment in some cases. Hearts to perceive, minds to know. 
So we should use that as a cue that we need to verify what we're hearing through Scripture, right? Because that's our ultimate guide. And we've got to let God sort them out at the end. Because he, some of us were at a place where had God, had God come and done the judgment at some point in the past, I'm grateful he didn't come at some points in my life, I'm just saying. Because I would have been found unworthy and guilty of the worst and whatnot and I would not have been in the place that I want to be I don't know that I'm there now but I know that now I'm striving I know that I love God and I know that I love Jesus and I know that I love my sisters and brothers to the best of my ability and I'm going to trust that my faith in Jesus has got me in a place to where when it's time I get washed by the blood but in the meantime the warning that Jesus has given us is beware in and amongst the people that I've planted in, the seeds of the gospel in, in and among those people, the devil has planted his own seeds too. So what do we do about that? I know we see it. We all see it. We tend to think it's not in our living room. It's in somebody else's living room. We want to think we know that for a fact. So what do we do? Do we just talk about that and stay away from that? Mostly. Mostly. But do we pray for them? We should, right? We should be praying for them. Because as long as we're living and breathing here, isn't there a chance for redemption? That's one of the things that grace was, and we hold dear, is the fact that God can and does redeem people from those crazy places, from those bad decisions, from those things where they've, they've bought a bill of goods and they've gone down the wrong road. We can see it and we know it. Maybe we went down that road ourselves at one point and we were rescued. Do we leave room for others to get rescued? Do we pray that they'll get rescued? So when God does the sorting, they can be accounted among the righteous and not cast into the fire where there's gnashing of teeth and wailing? See, friends, that's really what it comes down to. Jesus tells us straight up, there's evil planted in the midst. I submit that every church USA has got their own sets, multiple, their own sets of seeds that the devil has planted throughout among the people. And I would also submit that nearly all of those people struggle in their own way with what that means when the Spirit's knocking on their heart, telling them, yeah, you know, you really probably don't want to do that. That's really probably not the right thing to tell that person. You know, you probably don't want to be that harsh about that. All the different things that might happen. Every church has these things going on, friends. So what do we do? Well, A, we don't rush to judgment. We leave the sorting to God. But we ourselves need to be praying for these people. Just like we need prayers for ourselves. Because who among us doesn't struggle with the things that Jesus is talking about here? Those seeds that are planted. See, last week we had good seeds planted in people. And some people's hearts weren't receptive. Some people's hearts were receptive, but they had too many pressures from the world. And other people, people they were receptive, but then the devil comes along and puts stuff in their head and wipes it away. And there's others that when they receive the seed, they start growing. And I, that's all of us, right? And we talked about the miraculous produce. Well, friends, the produce we talked about last week was all the people that we infect in the course of our life. Those hard-headed teenagers and everybody else that we, 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 we share the gospel with and we try to be witnesses to. But that fruit isn't about just other people. It's also the spiritual gifts and the things that grow in us. See, as God works in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and He grows us in our faith and grows us in stature and in depth of our faith, we start exhibiting those fruit of the Spirit. I should hope that all of us can look back a certain amount in our life and realize that we're gentler than we were 
we have more self-control than we used to have. We're more patient in spite of having teenagers. There's a lot of things that have happened now in our life as a result of being in a body of believers and doing the things that we do as we're growing in our faith. We study scripture. We do service work. We come to worship together. We share our tough times with our sisters and brothers, and we hold each other. We hold each other accountable. We hold each other up. We do the things that Jesus modeled for us. And sometimes we just cry together. But through all that, we've learned the fruit of the Spirit has become manifest in us. And all those things become manifold as part of our witness. The 30, 60, 100-fold can also occur in us. And so today when we get this lesson, this warning from Jesus, the clarification comes where, be careful. Some of those seeds might be planted in you from the evil one. Maybe they haven't sprouted in your life at all. Maybe they haven't in a long time. But if they ever have before, do you think they're totally gone? Maybe. I mean, certainly if Jesus has relieved you of a burden, it's gone. But because the devil is the continuous tempter, doesn't mean he won't come back around with it. Paul faced that. Paul, the guy that was blinded, knocked off the horse. Jesus spoke directly too. And there were things he couldn't conquer in this human existence. Now we surrender by degrees, right? We let go and let God. We study, we get a little understanding, we, we learn to let go, we learn the things we need to do, and the Spirit leads us to, to do certain things that, look, that wasn't part of who I am for most of my life, but now I'm this way. It's like the woman said, uh, uh, Mary said on the movie The Chosen, she says, all I can tell you is I was one way, and now I'm another, and the thing that happened in between was Him, was Jesus. And for many of us, that's what happened. Jesus came along and sowed his good seed in our heart. And it was a good seed. And it's bore fruit. It's born seeds in our life. But sometimes, while that's growing, those pesky weeds grow up in our life. Those old bad habits, those old bad behaviors, the things that pop up in us. We recognize them more easily when it's us, ourselves, Or maybe not. Maybe we don't recognize them in ourselves. Maybe we're just real good at recognizing it in others. Anybody suffer from that? (laughs) Yeah, we can recognize the stuff in others, but we can't see our own. It's that splinter plank thing. But what we should know, friends, is when we encounter those things, we should know it's not a surprise. Jesus warned us it would happen. Right? Jesus warned it would happen. And he said, but take it easy. Because he knows what it's about. He'll sort it out. In the meantime, give the Spirit time to work. Isn't that what we want? Don't we want that grace? I do. So may we become better givers of the grace by not being judgmental. Now, that, uh, the judgmental goes two ways, by the way. Not being judging of other people, but also having good judgment to know when you're hearing something that's not true and not right, you don't fall for it and follow it, okay? If you have a question about something, that's when you consult the authority. And it's not Google, it's Scripture. I know it's easier to Google. If if you use Google to find where does the Bible say this, and then you go to the Bible, that's fine. But don't just Google it and just let that be that, okay? Just go to your scripture too. But friends, we're all working towards the same end, right? Aren't we? We're working towards that end to where that day when we go to sleep for the last time and we wake up, we're with Jesus. Isn't that the end we're all living for? I don't know about y'all, but I'm living for just those few words. Well done, good and faithful servant. And if we stay focused on what we need to do, listen to the Spirit speaking into our heart. Let God worry about the weeds. Let the Spirit pull the weeds out of our life. 
then we don't have to worry about being judges. We just have to worry about walking into Jesus' arms and let God sort out all that other stuff. Sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? But we know it's anything but. So friends, just relax. Focus on Jesus. Stay in your Bible. And let God sort out all this other stuff. Because he knows full well what's going on. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today at the uh, memorial service for George, I was talking with somebody from another church uh, that I've known for a long time. And uh, uh, we were talking about communion. And they said the church they go to only does it like on Sunday nights. They don't do it during the worship services. It's a different, it's a denomination that's well known. I said, oh, we do it every Saturday night. You do? Oh, yeah, every Saturday night. Really? That's not really Methodist. No, well, we, on Sundays we only do it once a month, but on Saturday nights we do it every week. He said, what started that? And I said, well, a combination of things. First of all, somebody asked if we could, honest, true story. And secondly, when we were doing the Wesley study, John Wesley said, take communion as often as you can. And I learned that Wesley would take it four times a day every day. Okay. Now, he was probably taking real wine, but I'm not saying anything. But the point is, is that we should be partaking of the sacrament as often as we can, right? So in, the, in that vein, we celebrate communion every week at this service. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had a meal with his disciples in the upper room, that last Passover that Jesus celebrated on earth. At the beginning of that meal, he took the bread. He raised it to heaven, thanked God for it. Then he blessed it and he broke it. He passed it to his disciples, and he said, This bread is my body, broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. At the end of the meal, he took the chalice of wine, and he raised it to heaven, and he gave thanks for it. Then he blessed it, and he passed it to his disciples, and he said, This wine is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's the blood of the new covenant. Each time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me and so Lord we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to make for us this bread and juice the body and blood of Christ so that when we partake of it we might become the body and blood of Christ to the world that's in desperate need of his love we ask this in Jesus precious name Amen friends we serve communion two ways here at Grace Wesley and the first way is we serve it by intention We'll ask everybody to come up and just form a line. If you prefer to take it at your seat, you can. Tony has a tray. He'll bring around the little cups. And we have gluten-free if you would prefer a gluten-free uh, wafer. Friends, the table is open. Won't you come? Well, good afternoon, church. It's my pleasure to bring to you this afternoon uh, prayers for the people. Myron mentioned that earlier today we had a beautiful celebration of life for George Paparelli and so we need to keep his wife Patricia and the rest of the family in our prayers and uh, we're asking for the peace and comfort our brother Ray Stapleton his mom is here today on Tuesday Ray had a very successful knee Placement surgery, and uh, we just thank God that everything went well with that surgery. Dora Romero, her daughter was rushed to the emergency room on Tuesday when she came to the uh, Tuesday night Bible study, so she had to rush off and, and see about her daughter. Well, she's back home. And the doctors are now having to look at doing a number of different uh, tests and scans, such as an echocardiogram and neurological exams to find out exactly what is really going on with her. You know, my friend Ram, I mentioned to him, he's the one who had the toe amputated. Well, on Wednesday, 
the doctors amputated uh, his right, uh, no, his left leg. Again, he is still in, uh, in a bad shape as far as mentally. And obviously, you don't know what it would be like if all of a sudden, you know, you now have lost a limb. So anyway, we need to pray f for peace and comfort for my friend Ram. Billy and Ken Bodine has asked us to pray for their daughters, their reconciliation. They haven't spoken to each other in over a year. And that's really tough. I come from a family, my mama raised 11 kids. And I can't imagine what it'd be like not to be able to speak to any one of my brothers and sisters. So we need to really pray hard for these girls to find a way to reconcile. Uh, Billy and uh, Ken mentioned that uh, their friend Terry and Pat Divers, where Pat recently had a stroke and she's in the ICU at uh, Holy Cross. So we need to pray for Pat overcome the stroke. Uh, Debbie Thurston, you know, who sings in the choir on Sundays, she just lost another brother-in-law. It's about uh, oh, five months ago. She had to go to the Bahamas because of the death of one of her brother-in-laws. And she just lost another one uh, last week. So we need to pray for Debbie and her family. We also then need to pray for traveling mercies for our pastor Myron and Annette as they go on their travels to celebrate his mother's 90th birthday. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we just want to we want to thank you for bringing someone like George Pepperelli into our lives. He was a faithful servant who loved others and greeted them with a wonderful hug. And you have called him home. And we pray, Father, that as you greeted him, You've greeted him with the words that we are anxious to hear for ourselves. Well done, good and faithful servant. So, Father, we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit of peace and comfort upon his wife, Patricia, and all of the rest of the Paparelli's family. Father, we also thank you for bringing our brothers and sisters through the storm and surgeries, knee replacements, emergency room visits, and most definitely, Father, for those who wake up and find a missing part of their bodies gone. So we pray, Father, that you give all of those coming through the storm the peace and comfort they need. And also, Father, we pray for traveling mercies as Myron and Annette travels to Arkansas. And so, Father, we pray the prayer that your son Jesus Christ has taught us as we say, Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for Let's all stand and sing holy, holy, holy.
Thank you, Freddie. Friends, we all know there's evil in the world. We perhaps even know there's some in our midst. We might even realize some of it's in us. Scary as that might be. But the good news is, God's working on us. He's working on all of us. He's working on everybody. Let us pray for those who we know are misguided or misled. Pray for them so that they might find their right path with God too. Because at the end, God will sort them out. May we be found worthy of admission to eternity with Jesus because we claim Him as Savior and we welcome being washed in His blood. So when you contemplate this week what that might mean for you, remember folks, Emmanuel, God is with us all the time. Go in peace, friends. Amen.